right now on Movie Review Talk for Collider, Kate Blanchett and Jack Black, and a house with a clock at its, at its walls. And look out, Michael Moore returns with a new movie. Hey everyone, welcome to Movie Review Talk for Collider. I'm your host, Scott Movie Mance. Every week, we review the new movies. We pick a Blu-ray for something you might have missed. We pick something that's streaming because there is a lot streaming and a, something like a, a gem, a diamond in the rough that you need to see. We'll talk about that too. Every week, I'm joined by two guest critics. And here's the thing. This is a spoiler-free zone. No spoilers here, so you can watch to your heart's content. You can share movie review talk with everyone and make sure they share movie review talk with everyone so we can keep talking about movies here on Collider every single week. This week's guest critics, she is a freelance writer for Marie Claire, Harper's Bazaar, and Cosmopolitan. Please welcome Yolanda Machado. Hi. Very excited. Thank you so much so for being happy here. happy to be here. Thank you. Perry, so, so highly of you. I'm like, that's good enough for me. She is in <laughs> and here you are. That's how we roll here at Collider. Awesome. And she he is my good friend, Jimmy Oster, from Joe Blow and Arrow in the Head. Yes. What is Arrow in the Head, man? We, we, it's all about the horror. It was started, it's, it's a sister side to Joe Blow and John Fallon started it, and it's, I love it. It's all horror, and we get to talk about everything, even the dirty, grimy crap that no one gets to see. I love that. I well, love that, that is up your alley, isn't yes, it? Yes, that is my I love stuff. that about you, Yes, man. of course, man. <laughs> very, very good. Well, let's get right to it. Our first movie is Life Itself, written and directed by Dan. Yeah. It's just, I, I walked out of there with a broken heart, but not the way I wanted it to have been broken. <laughs> <laughs> How so? What was wrong with this movie? Everything. Um, the only... Like the the final chapter is the only one that made any sense to me. Um, it treated women terribly throughout. Um, How so? What? Why do you say that? It was telling their stories through the male point of view, and it was variations of the Manny Pixie Dream Girl, and um, it just wasn't a concise storyline. And everybody, I, I mean, not to give anything away, but it was just terrible. Like. Uh, and each moment that passed, I'm like, it's got to get better. It's going to get better. Something's going to happen that's going to tie all this together. That's but what was make- it that wasn't working for you? I mean, you're watching the film and it's not working for you. Can you do you know what it was that it, that other than it being told from the male point of view when it was about women too? Mm-hmm. What what else did what didn't work for you? It was very choppy. Okay. Um, when I after watching it, I was like, this was definitely written by a TV writer. Like maybe if he had a full season or more time, there would have been ways to weave it better together. And it just failed terribly. Okay. All right, Jimmy, what do you think? Well, speaking of horror, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> it, I, honestly, I walked out of this movie. Uh, I, I, you're supposed to feel something, right? You're supposed to care. I literally laughed at this film. You laugh. I laughed when tragedy occurs because it's so unrealistic. There's n- there's not a, a sincere bone in this film's body at all. Oscar Isaac, who I'm a fan of, he's a fantastic actor, but my god, it's it this I felt like I was watching, you know, when you go to acting school and they they line up, okay, you have this monologue, you have this monologue. That's what it was like. Let's just give them a chance to shine in their moment with absolutely no spark, nothing. It was such an empty film. Okay, now you're both hitting on on problems that I have with the movie. I have mm-hmm. to say, uh, I know the movie does have issues, but it's it's really getting slammed, like <laughs> really getting slammed. But Rotten Tomatoes, the last time I checked, it was like 11. percent It's too high. That is, <laughs> well, that's too high. But you know what? I mean, I didn't hate the movie, but I do see that the movie had issues. And Yolanda, mm-hmm. you hit on something that that Dan Felgeman is a TV writer, and you know this movie is proof that that what works for TV doesn't always mm-hmm. work for film. And I think that's the big problem here. You know, he tries to do sort of like a, an interweaving ensemble that's sort of a cross between uh, something like Robert Altman might do, but yeah. also something like uh, Alejandro Gonzalez, Ina Ritu's Babel did. Mm-hmm. And it, it comes up way short because the movie is overwritten. Oh, like the emotions Lord. felt forced. 
It felt it's like I felt like I was being manipulated. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was being manipulated. The emotions were not authentic or genuine, and I hate when my buttons are pushed. I feel like the movie is overwritten. Like people don't talk like that, and it just didn't feel real to me. And uh, I, I look, I love Oscar Isaac. I think he's awesome. Olivia Wilde, Annette Bening, Antonio Banderas in the movie. You know, in, in some ways, I thought it was deep and profound. But as the movie progressed, it, it lost its luster for me because I did not feel that the emotions were genuine. I think that was a big problem for mm -hmm. me. Was that, was that what didn't do it for you too, Yolanda? I felt constantly being manipulated, mm -hmm. manipulated, um, just like shock stuff for shock value's sake. And I mean, the good part is, yeah, he had a fantastic cast that could sell it, yeah. but you still could see what they were doing. like. And for me to not get lost in an Oscar Isaac performance like that, that's saying something. Because I, I would, like, he could read a phone book and I'll be like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but his chapter was the one I had the biggest The beginning, yeah, the beginning with. of him. Uh -huh. um, and then, I mean, this is all over the internet, so I don't consider it a spoiler, but when you yell out uh, what, unreliable narrator over and over and over, it's like you're trying to shove it down people's throats. And, yeah. This is what it's about. This is what it's about. But that's that's the forced. problem with the movie. Yeah. You know. Everything was forced. Yeah. Every emotion was. They even handed out tissue before one of the screenings. You know? oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, it's like you can't force emotion. I mean, this movie made like terms of endearment subtle. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is a bold statement, yeah, Jimmy. Absolutely true. All right, what's your letter grade? Uh, D minus. D minus. Ouch. D Yolanda, minus. What's yours? Uh, I'm saying D plus, and it's only because of the Spanish chapter. That one I actually enjoyed. <laughs> okay, the Spanish chapter with Antonio Banderas. Yeah, he was phenomenal. Yeah, he was very good in the mm -hmm. film. Wow. Okay, you know what? Listen, the movie does try. It tries too hard. I give it an A for effort, but an E for execution. So I'm going to compromise and give the movie a C. So, uh, you know, That's so uh, nice it's a nice of me, <laughs> but it's, also, it's <laughs> also not a ringing endorsement for the film. Moving on to A House with a Clock in Its Walls. The movie is directed by Eli Roth, who who has made his name, Mr. Jimmy, you'll know this, yes. obviously, with Cabin Fever and Hostel. Real, real hard are uh, horror movies. Uh, the cast is Jack Black, Kate Blanchett, Owen Vaccaro. It's about a young boy who goes to live with his uncle in a big spooky house where the centerpiece clock in its walls has magical and, and maybe even uh, bad powers. Okay, Jimmy, what did you think of this one? Wow, I was surprised. I mean, surprise I, good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Here I see, I've seen Eli Roth. I've, I've watched his movies from the very beginning. I've liked some. I haven't liked others. Uh, this one surprised me on so many levels. He, th this cast is phenomenal. Kate Blanchett is always stunning. Uh, you, Jack Black is great. I love the kid. He was wonderful. Uh, there's something. Uh, I like the fact that he wasn't afraid to go with the horror. It's a little gruesome. I think the some of the the poop jokes went a little too far. Yeah, but yeah, it was it was an enchanting little film. It wasn't. It's not going to change your world. But if your kids want to see it, it's a great way to introduce them to horror in okay. a safe and fun Fair. way. And you're saying that as a father too. As a so father, absolutely. I'm like I I had it, I enjoyed taking my kid to this one, and I my expectations were pretty low to be honest. But yeah, it, it's a it's a very sweet, fun. It reminded me of like the old like Watcher in the Woods, those kinds of goofy '70s kids horror movies. I, I, I like that. Okay, Yolanda. Mm. I actually really enjoyed it. I didn't think I was going to. Um, I am a mother myself, but my daughter is really into horror films. Oh, okay. So I have a different measure for this because I took her with me just to see if it was any bit scary. And she, I mean, she's 11. She doesn't think it's scary at all. But what did you think? I thought it was fun. I mean, I, like my measure of kids movies now is, am I going to be able to tolerate it all the way through? <laughs> um, but this one, I enjoyed it. It was funny. Jack Black and Kate Blanchett really work as this so quirky. Well. They're not, they're not a couple, but they're like this quirky pairing. They, Worked off, riffed off each other really well, and the kid is adorable. Oh, yeah. um, I might have wanted them to go m a little bit more witty. Like um, the the jokes were funny, but I think they were they at the storyline with like when the kid's parents kind of was open ended a little oh, bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but overall, I mean, I would definitely recommend uh, families to take this 
Probably not for little toddlers, though, because there were some moments where I was like, oh, she would have been terrified. What do you think? Jenny? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the scene with the, the pumpkins is a little gruesome. And I, I, I like the fact that it was... It was almost like Nickelodeon gruesome. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, you know what? Nickelodeon, that's a sort of great way to, to sort mm-hmm. of describe this movie. First yeah. of all, Eli Roth sort of like, you know, branching out and doing something family friendly, mm-hmm. mostly succeeding. Uh, it's a big departure for him. And I, you know, I, think it's, I think it's a fun movie. It's not a home run, but it's a double. You know, Kate Blanchett and Jack Black were, were committed and fun. And it was really great to see Kate Blanchett do something fun and mm-hmm. not too heavy, you know, not like in a, you know, Oscar bait kind of role. Like she really has fun with it. And the, the, the young boy, uh, Owen Vakar, was also very oh, good. Yeah. Held his own with these two acting, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, experienced actors like Jack Black and obviously Kate Blanchett. Um, the movie has, has, you know, good special effects. It has heart. It has humor. It has scares. But, but ultimately, it, it, it didn't really know what it wanted to be for me. Like, mm. uh, it, it was unfocused. You know, okay. it was not balanced. And... You know, I didn't think it was scary. I mean, granted, I'm not a father, so I didn't have that perspective. Uh, but I thought it was fun enough. I thought it was okay. Uh, you know, definitely for a September movie. You know, uh, as we're starting to gear up for Halloween, yeah. it's, it's it's good enough. Uh, you know, the whimsy, the overall problem with this movie, you know, Nick, the Nickelodeon angle is the best sort of way to describe the film. Uh, it is family friendly, uh, like a Goosebumps kind of thing. Yeah. But the whimsy. And the uh, wonder of it all felt forced, like it tried too hard. You're pointing like you agree. Yeah, I kind of had hoped it went, uh, I mean, and I hate to compare stuff, but you got you to do it with kids' movies. But it should have been a little bit more on the Harry Potter whimsy right. side. Mm-hmm. Right. And it wasn't. Yep. Um, it, but it was fun. I mean, I'm not going to try. I, I enjoyed it. I sat through it and I walked out. I was like, hey, this was surprisingly not bad. Yeah. Especially with uh, going Eli Roth, I was a little concerned. I'm like, what, <laughs> is, what, what is he doing a, a kid's movie for? Because, yeah. I mean, my daughter, she watches horror, but she's not allowed to watch his movies yet. Yeah. So. Uh, well, now she can. <laughs> yes. This is the first Eli Roth movie for like <laughs> thousands of kids, right? What's your letter grade, Jimmy? Uh, B plus. B plus. Yeah. All right, Yolanda? B. B. See, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, you definitely got, you liked it more than I did. Uh, I, I give it like a B minus. I mean, it was okay. That's fair. I mean, yeah. You know, it's a, fa- it's a fair grade. Yeah. Okay, moving on. He is back and ready to party. Michael Moore, the contrarian documentarian behind uh, Bowling for Columbine, Roger and Me, and of course Fahrenheit 9/11, returns with Fahrenheit 11/9. The film stars President Donald Trump and how he got to be that way. In November of 2016. Trump Trump was elected president. The movie asks literally how the F did that happen? Michael Moore's words, not mine. But it also examines gun violence, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, and the power of grassroots democratic movements. Yolanda, what did you think of Fahrenheit 11.9? Uh, it, was, it was a horror movie for me. because yeah. <laughs> living a horror movie. We're, we are, yeah. we are, but it was... Uh, especially the way they opened the film, I was reliving all my emotions from there. Uh, but I think it was interesting how he tied all these crises that were ha- like the Flint crisis and everything. We're tying it all together, and because to me that was like a wake up call. I was like, wait a second. Uh, but again, it is Michael Moore, so you kind of know that's what he wants to do, and he's really good at what he does. I my only request to him would have been, why didn't you include? Um, Puerto Rico, what happened there? Because that was not included, where he included probably everything else. Uh, that would have made a, a large, a bigger impact and terrified me even more. But still, <laughs> I, I liked it. Well, I, I liked it a lot. I mean, you know, the thing about my, the last few Michael Moore movies, and like, you know, Where Do We Invade Next and uh, Sicko, is you know, he definitely is, is very far to the left, mm-hmm. and you know, he. You know, his best movie, I think, is uh, Bowling for Columbine. Uh, yes. And followed by Fahrenheit 9 11. Those movies were focused. Uh, the, the last few movies, they're not focused. Like, I thought this movie was just going to be about how did Donald Trump get to be president. And by the way, you know, um, we're reviewing the film. We're not reviewing the president. Just, yeah. That's, that's okay. to be clear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're just reviewing the film because, you know, a lot of our viewers, you know, a lot, some of them like Trump, some of them don't. We're not, we're not taking sides here on that. We're just reviewing the movie. And in this case, you know, with Fahrenheit 11.9, 
you know, it, when it's when it gets into like like how you know the year before all the political pundits on CNN and headline news and everywhere, you know, they're all oh it'll never happen. He'll never get to be president. They were laughing it off, and then it happened. Um, so when the movie is focusing on that, I was really into it, uh, even though it didn't really tell me anything new. Mm -hmm. But having it all all sort of like there just to watch it, you know, with that progression, like bottled up like that. And when the movie gets into the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, and the, uh, the teacher crisis in, in uh, West Virginia, um, I liked those stories, but I felt like, you know, this sort of movie went off on tangents. You know, those, those subjects are worthy of their own films. That's yeah. what I was going to say. I mean, instead of focusing, I, I didn't see the movie, obviously. That's why I'm not talking about it. But <laughs> yes, it, it, the, the idea of all that, he's got a lot of ideas that he could put into, put all his energy into one. I think it'd be much more effective. Yeah. See, I thought it actually was good because it did kind of like the, the thing that like when Obama, th there's a scene where, you know, he showed that Obama's in Flint. Obviously, it's part, in the trailer, too. Mm -hmm. Um all the stuff that went on there, I was unaware of. Me too. And I thought it was a good lead into how we got here, how we got this president. Um, and I think he was actually very fair that he criticized Obama as well as Hillary. Good point, yeah. Um, because, yeah, he is super liberal, and that would be the go-to comment is, well, you didn't criticize. No, he, he went for it. And, yeah, you're And then right. he criticized the whole Democratic Party as a whole. And as a, I, like, I really appreciated that because there, you don't see a liberal Democrat going after a liberal Democrat Area, well, Yolanda, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. I, uh, you know, the the movie does, you know, he he definitely has his point of view, and he's definitely a very very liberal uh, filmmaker, documentarian, mm -hmm. um, a political pundit, all of those things. And you're right, it, it does show a little bit more balance than he usually does because mm -hmm. he does go after the Democrats, but he also goes after democracy in general by saying that you know you can't just fall back on the on the word democracy and assume that everything's going to be mm -hmm. okay. The movie is a, is a call to action, like hey. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you got to remember that that democracy has to be earned. You have to put it into action. You have to enforce it. You have to live it, eat it, breathe it. The Constitution is not a paper with magical powers. You have to practice it, and that's the reminder here. You know, he does sort of uh, go into very interesting uh, uh, parallels between between the, the Trump administration leading up to his presidency and and the 30s in Berlin, you know, Germany, fascism, Hitler. I mean, he really goes for it there and it is jaw dropping. The problem overall with Michael Moore in general, and I don't mean this is a problem with him so much as a problem with his movies that they preach to the choir. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, they <clears throat> preach to the choir. If you if you agree with where he stands on gun control, on uh, health care, on Trump, and you'll see the movie, but the people who, who do not agree with him, mm -hmm. how, do you get the, how do you get them to see a movie about that's anti-Trump? See, yeah. I, don't, I don't think you can. I mean, they're going to go in, and, and it's hard to even talk about this movie without kind of showing where you land, but just to be you know, in the middle here, I don't. I don't think anyone who is pro-Trump would would want to watch him and exactly. would believe a word he says. To right. be honest, right? So, I, what do you think a lot? I wish that they would actually cut a trailer of the criticisms he did, because then maybe it would entice those people. Maybe I'll give this one a shot, because then he also. I mean, uh, like we're trying to be spoiler-free, but he mm. does give associations where you know it's like, hey, I was actually friendly with the, this Republican side for a mm. while. Like we were friends. Like they, we've been on shows together and all that was surprising to me because it was like revealing a different side of him like oh wait you're not this always angry super liberal <laughs> guy like right. you can talk to the other side um, you can criticize democratic leaders and I think if you know hardcore um, like right wing conservative people would see that section of the movie even if a small trailer maybe they'd consider watching the whole thing and they're they're not going to agree with most of it or yeah. at least half of it but there might be something there that they didn't know 
before. You know what's funny? Is that talking to you about this movie now, Yolanda, uh, I, I agree with you. You know, the, the more I see, see it from, from your perspective and having seen the movie twice, I saw it at TIFF and I saw it again the other night, uh, it, it, it definitely is more of a balanced film than, than, than you, ex you, you expect from, yeah. from, mm -hmm. from more. And again, well. not to review the present, just to review the film. It, it is, a, it is a, an engrossing movie. Um, you know, it's tragic and tragically funny at the same time. Uh, what's your letter grade on this? Uh, I'm going to give it an A. I'm going to give it an A minus. Yeah, well, I, I guess I'm it. seeing this. Yeah. <laughs> See it, Jimmy. I will. I'm sorry I missed it. Okay, you know what? Like with all the streaming channels now, uh, with streaming new stuff, you know, Hulu, yeah. Amazon, and especially Netflix, there's a lot to watch. And, so you know, much watch. There, there's so much. I mean, not <laughs> only like the TV shows, but like they're doing like original films now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, when, when a film, when a TV show like, like, uh, and, like this Maniac with Emma Stone and, and uh, Jonah Hill, like, and obviously Stranger Things, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, uh, Glow. When shows like that drop, everyone knows about them. But when the movies drop, they kind of get lost. Yeah. So, so I really want to use the show, a movie review talk on Collider, to sort of shine a light on movies that, that might get lost, especially this next one that is on Netflix, streaming right now, Land mm. of Steady Habits, written and directed by Nicole Holof Center, uh, who did Enough Said, Please give Walking and Talking, among others. The cast is Ben Mendelsohn and Edie Falco. And Ben Mendelsohn plays a middle-aged man, leaves his wife, leaves his job, going through a massive, massive midlife crisis. <laughs> Did he do the right thing? Okay, uh, Jimmy. Wow. I See, I had no idea. Uh, you were the one who told me about this movie. I think I'd gotten a couple of notes on it. I was really surprised. See, this is a movie that life itself should have been. Good point. This is a movie because you have Ben Mendelsohn, who is tragic. He's flawed. He's but he's a real person. It, it, it's not like he's walking down the street, he gets hit by a car, and then he gets uh, his head chopped off. It, it, it's so realistic and, yeah. and uh, the relationships he has Edie Falco is always amazing to watch. She's incredible in this. I actually wish there were had been more of her. Uh, Connie Britton, Connie Britton, love of my life, I adore this woman. <laughs> uh, this is a, a heartfelt movie that examines a family that is in turmoil, but without resorting to melodrama. Exactly, without yeah. resorting, to, it, and it's not in judgmental. What this guy, what Ben Mendelsohn goes through, especially with uh, Charlie Tan mm -hmm. from yep. so, uh, Charlie St. Clouds back. Uh, I love that little relation between those two. It right, was a sure. really interesting film with very flawed characters. It was it was deep, it was profound. I mean, you know, I, I think just uh, in, in the 21st century, a movie that looks at suburbia and, and being middle aged yeah. and uh, you know, uh, being relationships that are that are not working or don't work and you you have to restart your life in your fifties. Uh, I have to say I, I can relate to that. Yolanda, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I love Ben Mendelsohn and Edie Falco, and oh, so I am loving this era of flawed characters in general because it does. Like, I hated for the longest time that everyone had to live up to this certain potential or this certain look to be living in suburbia or you know at a certain age you had to be here, you had to be, and it's never like that. Mm -hmm. So this film, it's so many flawed characters just living, and they're not doing these horrible things that life itself did. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I can't wait to see more films like this on Netflix, especially because I think these are these films, they don't just get lost streaming. They get lost in theatrical release. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah, oh, they, big some, time. Some mm -hmm. don't even get a theatrical yeah, release. Yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, listen, I, I'm a big fan of, of, of the streaming services so much where I don't even have cable anymore. I mean, 90% of what I watch is on Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. Mm -hmm. And when I'm not home watching these channels, I'm watching movies because that's, mm -hmm. that's what I do. That's what we cover. Um, but, you know, this film to me, it's interesting. I didn't think about it as sort of a uh, better version of life itself. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way to put it. I also feel like if you take a movie like American Beauty, uh, the 1999 Oscar winning best picture. Absolutely. Uh, this film is a more realistic and relatable sort of take on many of those themes. Ben Mendelsohn, I agree with you, is, is so a great good. actor. You know, he can play the villain in like Rogue One and Ready Player One, but he's also doing a lot of great work on independent movies. So this is one of them. And the Call Half Center, who is, I've, I've always like, like, she's one of those directors and writer directors where whenever 
she makes a movie, you know, because she's not one who like makes a movie every other year or whatever. Like I'm there, you know, walking and talking. Uh, please give. I loved enough said uh, with uh, you know James Gandolfini. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And, and this one is is uh, a, a, is is a right up there with the very best of her work. Uh, what's your letter grade? Uh, B plus. B plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm gonna say A minus. Yeah, I'll give yeah. it a B plus. I yeah. mean, I, I mean, I liked it a lot. Um, you know, it, it's sometimes the 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 it, it's like a drama, but but out of the drama, you know, just as in life, you know, some some humorous moments come out of that, and I think that is effectively conveyed in this movie. All right, now we move on to a movie that is new on Blu-ray and a movie that underperformed critically and commercially at the box office. Finally out on Blu-ray right now is Solo, A Star Wars Story. Uh, the movie's directed by Ron Howard. The cast is Alton Ehrenreich, Amelia Clark, and Donald Glover. And this is the story of how everyone's favorite nerf herder won the Millennium Falcon and made a big furry friend. Uh, full disclosure, when this movie came out in May, I did not really like it. And, uh, well, Yolanda, what'd you think? I wasn't impressed by it either. I was... Very so so, and we're my, my family. We're a huge Star Wars family. So I, when I walked out, I was like, oh. <laughs> "What? What? What was? What was missing for you?" The magic. Okay. Oh, it didn't feel like a Star Wars film, and okay. I'm not saying everything has to be this cookie cutter formula, but there's usually this element of magic with mm -hmm. all of them, and this one just did not have it. Okay. Well, full disclosure for me, I'm so sick of Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't like Last Jedi. I, I really hated Last Jedi. I thought it was horrible. Uh, I didn't like uh, Rogue One at all. I thought Force Awakens was fine. I enjoyed it for what it was, a remake of the first film. I really haven't been that impressed with the, uh, them since the original, so I avoided this one until you, can you go sit over there. Until yesterday, <laughs> and guess what? I enjoyed this okay, one. Okay, what did you like about because it? Because this, I, 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 I disagree a little bit. I actually found it more like the original Star Wars. I thought there was more magic. I didn't think it was forced. I didn't. It was just a fun, campy B movie cliffhanger ride, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed him. I didn't expect to like him as Han Solo. I, I enjoyed the cast. I thought Woody Harrelson was a blast. I yeah, it was. I'm not saying this is going to change your world or rock your world, but. For me, it was closer to the Star Wars feeling that I used to enjoy. See, that's very interesting. I, I watched it again, and you know, I thought maybe when it came out in May, I was a little too hard on the movie, so I thought I'd give it another <laughs> shot. And no, I, I still <laughs> stick by my original opinion. You know, for one thing, Alden Ehrenreich, who I like very much as an actor, uh, you know, uh, he just didn't have the commanding screen present, the gravitas of Harrison Ford. And you know, I've, in the last over the last few months, I've had people to say, "How can you compare Alden Ehrenreich to Harrison Ford?" Mm -hmm. Well, because he's playing Han Solo. Yeah, exactly. exactly. He's playing. The character. You know, I'm not comparing, uh, you know, uh, to a Harrison Ford performance in a different movie. Yeah. You're comparing apples to apples here. And Alden, he's fine, but I felt that there were times in most cases where the movie overshadowed him, mm. his performance. Uh, having said that, I thought that uh, uh, Donald Glover was very good as Ben Calrissian. Uh, but overall, for me, the reason why the movie didn't work for me the story just wasn't interesting. There was no mm. magic to it, like you mm -hmm. said. There was no imagination to it. I didn't feel like I was watching something not just different from the other Star Wars movies, but you know, the, the, the backstory didn't grab me. It didn't interest me. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, you know, it, it just didn't feel, here it is, it, it didn't feel necessary. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that well, I can agree on. Not, yeah, it, <laughs> it wasn't, feel it wasn't. Like a story that needed to be told. And, you know, the, the, the thing is with, like, you, like, comparing Lucasfilm, comparing Star Wars, where they're trying to make a Star Wars cinematic universe and have offshoots like that, uh, to Marvel, which are both owned by Disney, where you can have three Marvel movies a year and they all do really well, and in most cases they're good or great. So why, why is what's working for Marvel not working for Star Wars? And I think here's the problem. 
because in Marvel, you have a lot of different characters and you have different directors bringing their own vision to it. Like look what Peyton Reed did with Mm Ant-Man, you know, look what Ryan Coogler did with Black Panther and look what the Russo brothers did with Avengers. And then you have like, uh, you know, you have, uh, um, you know, Doctor Strange was very different because it was more supernatural. Mm -hmm. But the Star Wars movies are all revolving around the same universe, around the same ideas. You said Force Awakens felt like a remake of the first movie. That's why I didn't like, I mean, I liked it, but I didn't yeah. love it. I felt like I was watching a rehash of A New, a new Hope. And, See, I liked it. and for me, Rogue One, <laughs> to me, even though it was, it led into A New Hope, uh, I felt like that felt more like a Star Wars movie to me than, than anything else. And I, like you, I was not impressed by Last Jedi. I, no. I, it just didn't, it didn't do it for me. That's a whole other conversation, but. <laughs> That's a long <laughs> conversation. <laughs> but, you know, Bob Iger, the president of Disney, uh, chairman of Disney, um, said that there was gonna be a bit of a slowdown in output from Star Wars after after episode nine, which opens in December of 2019. Do you, th- what, what do you think the problem is with these Star Wars movies? Like the last two? Yeah, I mean, critics liked The Last Jedi, but a lot of the mm-hmm. fans did not. Oh, from, this is talking about me personally and, you know, as a mother and I talk to other mothers and it really is that the stories are still very focused on the guys. Like we want to, and even if they are the guys, they're not. They're like I would have loved to see a Lando film. He, I'm so curious about his background and everything. I would have loved to know more about Infant's Nets. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have loved to know about Thandie Newton's character some more. Um, but it, it it was all kind of just, and I get it, Han. You know, it's the Han story. But did we really need no a no, Han Solo we did not. story? <laughs> and, how do you recreate such an iconic character? You don't. Like exactly, we are. It was already good the first time, mm-hmm. yeah. and the kids today are watching those old films. Like my yeah. daughter, Han was her favorite character. Yeah, she walked into this movie. She's like, yeah, it was all right. <laughs> like she's not looking forward to another one. Basically, fix Star Wars. One, Jimmy. one thing I all agree with you: Thandi Newton was wasted, and that she, mm-hmm. need, totally she needed a better yeah, role. I agree, but I, I, it's too much. It's just too much. You know when. When you know the first films came out, they waited years for in years. between, and it built the anticipation. And you couldn't wait for the next movie. Now it's like, oh yeah, it's uh, Tuesday, so there must be a new movie coming out this Friday. When Last Jedi was over, I was not looking forward to Episode Nine. Like I, I could, it no. wasn't like like when I saw Force Awakens, I couldn't wait to see Episode Eight. But after seeing Episode Eight, I wasn't like, oh my god, I can't wait for Episode Nine. I'm like, I was under underwhelmed. I it, it ended on a whimper. It, it, it didn't do it for me. Yeah. I think overall. You know, like I said, I, I, like the first Star Wars was obviously, it, it changed everything. It mm-hmm. changed Hollywood, it changed the way movies were made, it changed blockbusters, it changed licensing and merchandising, yes. let's not forget that. And then like Empire Strikes Back was a superior sequel in every way, shape mm-hmm. or form. The best film in the series. Uh, the, not only is Empire Strikes Back the best film of the Star Wars series, it's one of the greatest movies ever made, period. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It yes. is the only film in the Star Wars series, other than the first one, obviously, uh, that transcends the franchise. It's just a masterpiece movie. 100%. But these totally first two right. movies, they took chances. Like the, the going from A New Hope, which is called Star Wars, to Empire Strikes Back, you saw Star Wars evolve. And unfortunately, since then, it has not evolved. You know, you've had the prequels, which fed into the original trilogy. Now you have the offshoot movies, which tell backstories to the original trilogy. And you have uh, the new trilogy, uh, the first two films, especially the first one anyway, Force Awakens, which is a remake of the first movie from the first trilogy. Mm -hmm. Star Wars needs to evolve. Surprise me. (laughs) Show imagination. Show originality. Do something different. If I want to rehash, if I want to go back and watch the other films, Mm -hmm. I can do that. Surprise me. Wow me. That's what I want from a Star Wars movie moving forward. And I hope that they do that. Be very, very curious to hear your comments below. Just please be nice. No trolls. No hate. (laughs) Be respectful <laughs> because you know we are touching on some things that we know that everyone who loves movies and loves Star Wars cares about. Yeah. So comment below if you're watching us on YouTube. Make sure you review us if you're listening to our podcast on Podcast One. And make sure you share our podcast so that everyone who doesn't watch it can also listen to Review Talk, Movie Review Talk for Collider. Make sure you hit us up on Twitter. Hit me up at Movie Mance at Collider Video. 
hashtag movie review talk. Let us know what you thought of the movies we talked about today. Let us know what you think of movie review talk because I really do want to know and I'm very active on social media. I will respond. Jimmy, where can people find you? You can find me on joeblow.com. You can find me on arrowinthehead.com. You can find me all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, Jimmy to the O. Jimmy to the O. Yolanda, how about you? The quickest way to find everywhere I am is on Twitter, and that's Sassy Mama in L.A. Well, uh, I have to say, you already know this, but I'm going to say it again. Anyway, follow me on Twitter at MovieMance. Follow me on Instagram at MovieMance. Again, hit us up. Let us know. Tweet us. Facebook us. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Instagram us. Whatever you want. I don't know if you're still using MySpace. Whatever uh, your Is anyone still using MySpace? <laughs> whatever floats your boat. And now next week on Movie Review Talk for Collider, Robert Redford. It's his last ever acting role in The Old Man and the Gun. We'll let you know what we thought of that. Until next time, here's looking at you, kid. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.